This is the story of my unusually deranged family that I had no part in choosing. My mother was an accountant at Millwork Factory, and there she met a man who she fell in love with and then married. That man had a daughter named Millie. Now, Millie was in college by the time they got married, and I was about to leave for college in a year. Millie did not attend the marriage function and came by a day letter and the very first day, she decided to fight with my mother as I came in my mother's defense. She stopped weirdly. She did not rage or act out, but just simply left the place. It was weird of her to just gently drop suddenly. I was not sure what happened. Days later, she came back to the house and apologized to my mother, and then later came into my room, apologized to me, and asked for us to be friends. I was not very sure what was going on, but there was definitely something wrong with her. She was very friendly to me, and in no way was like someone that my stepfather described her to be. We quickly became good friends, and I stopped overthinking about certain things. We started hanging out often, and we would talk a lot about things related to college, and she used to tell me about how to get ready for college and score with the girls and stuff like that. And then, one day, she introduced me to her friend Miguel. Miguel was just a covered-up name. Daniel held a small bag and he took it out, and rolled me one and offered me, and I refused. And then after a while, Millie came in closer and put the roll in my mouth and burned it as she whispered in my ear and told me to do it. And as I took one blunt, she put her hand on my leg and smoked it all with me. After a while, Daniel pulled me and said he wants me to become his partner and sell stuff there at college. I refused, but then she tried to persuade me into this and started frisking my leg in my hand and pushing and closing trying to persuade me to sell stuff. I just wanted her to stop, so I said yes. And then we did start the business. I made around $200 in a week, but after four to five weeks, she came and said that she wants out and I should get out. And then she told me that things are getting dangerous and we should quit while we are ahead. We started planning and told Daniel, but he was very violent about it. One day he barged into her dorm and tried forcing himself upon her and choking her. I entered in time and hit him in the head as he fell down. She retaliated and started bashing his head until he was dead. We were out of our senses, and then we decided to dispose of the body. And to this day, after seven years, nobody knows what happened. Even there was no news about Daniel, almost as if it was a ghost. My relationship with her was pretty weird, even though we have been living together ever since. I still cannot assess what my relationship with my stepsister is. This happened earlier in the year. I was on vacation in Costa Rica with my family, and one other family as well. Not counting me, the 17-year-old female, there were three other girls there, my sister Sophie of 14, my friend Julia of 15, and her sister Michaela of 11. Mac and Julia belonged to the other family. We were staying at a resort that had a massive pool. It was later at night, probably around 10ish, and our families decided that we were going to the pool for a swim. This was our second day, and we had gone on a volcano hike earlier, so we were looking forward to hanging out for a bit. The parents dashed off to the swimming bar that was up in one of the pools, and us kids decided we were going to go to the water slide which was in a completely different area. I was the oldest and fairly responsible as well as being a certified lifeguard. So the parents had little problem leaving me in charge of the rest of the girls. The four of us hung out in the pool, having a grand old time for a while. We all took turns going down the slide. It was kind of scary, actually. And after a while, the two youngest ones, Sophie and Mac, went off to find the parents and hang out with them for a bit. Julia and I stayed to go down the slide a few times. The slide was set up so that there was a long set of gradual steps that would wind up the side of this hill thing and into another little pool at the top, near the top of the slide. On the far side of this pool, there were a few more steps that led to the actual entrance of the slide. There were only a few trees and bushes that separated the steps from the resort road. By the entrance to the slide, there were no trees or anything that you could access the entrance from the road from. 
To put it simply, we had an obscured view to the road and vice versa. Anyway, Julia and I were standing at the top of the slide waiting for the last little kid to go down before we went. The kid went, and we kind of stood up there for a bit, just talking and taking advantage of the lack of younger siblings. When we heard this motorcycle drive by behind us on the road, we turned around, and sure enough, a man on a motorcycle was just cruising down the street. We didn't think anything of it and went down the slide. When we came back up for another go, the man was just sitting on his motorcycle out on the road. He wasn't blatantly watching us, but when we turned to look, he would find something to do and look away. Julia and I are teenage girls, and we're in pretty good shape, so it was creepy but not super weird that this dude was looking at us. We went down the slide a few more times each, and this dude would drive up on his motorcycle. We were pretty creeped out at this point, so we left. Julia and her family went to their room, and me and my family went to ours. I was in the bed closest to the window, and so I was the only one in my room who saw a headlight or something drive up to our window. We were on the bottom floor, and I leaned over and pulled back the blinds a little because it was late, because I wanted to know who was blasting their headlights in. Sure enough, it was the motorcycle dude. I was quite shaken, so I woke up my dad who went out onto the patio, and as soon as he saw him, because my dad stands at six foot one and is 200 pounds, the motorcycle man sped off. I stayed close to my family for the rest of the trip. Needless to say, creepy motorcycle man peeping on underage girls, let's not meet. Okay, so this isn't strictly my story, but the whole thing involves my grandpa and my great aunt, a sister. But since they're no longer with us anymore, it's one of the most horrifying true stories I've ever heard. And I figured I'm within my rights to tell it. My grandpa grew up during the Great Depression in a really poor town out in Oklahoma. I mean, the way my mom tells it, they really didn't have a pot to pee in. They used to eat stuff like dandelion salad, literally just eating boiled eggs with wild dandelions. They were that broke. Even worse for my grandpa and great aunt, who were like 12 and 8 years old respectively at the time. There's absolutely nothing to keep them entertained. They made a good go of it, turning pieces of junk into toys. Like never see that old-timey thing of a kid wiping a bike tire along with a stick. Yeah, that kind of thing. Their childhoods were just not like ours. They were accustomed to extreme boredom, grinding poverty, and back-breaking labor. So you can guess how excited they got when they heard the carnival was coming to town. There'd be games, rides, candy, sideshows, absolutely everything a kid that age could ever want. The only thing was, their family didn't have the money for them all to go. Just enough for two entry tickets with a little leftover for cotton candy. So being the good folks they were, my great grandparents decided they'd give the kids the money while they stayed home. It must have been like all their Christmases had come at once. The only condition was that my 12-year-old grandpa was not allowed to let my eight-year-old great aunt out of his sight. Then on the evening in question, grandpa and great honor given like 50 cents between them and told me back by sundown. Then they ran off down the pasture where the carnival had been given permission to set up the way my dad tells it for the first hour. So grandpa and great aunt had the time of their lives. I think tickets were like five cents or something. Then cotton candy was two cents a piece. Basically, the parents had underestimated how expensive stuff would be. So they were able to partake in everything the carnival had to offer twice. Maybe that's what led them to a false sense of security because it certainly accounts for them staying long after the sun started to set. Only when my grandpa realized how late it was, and he started looking around for my great aunt, she was nowhere to be seen. 
I want to remember asking my dad why they just thought it was okay to let their kids go running around in their own like that. If it's just like an old-timey thing, or because they were so poor. Dad said it was more like because all the people going to the carnival were their neighbors. They didn't figure there was any risk. But then there's my grandpa, totally unable to find his sister, and he's starting to get worried. He started asking all the people he recognized from our town if they'd seen his sister, but they all said no. Right up until one of our neighbors said they saw my great aunt walking hand in hand with the grown-up. I think they figured it was my great grandpa or something. But when my grandpa explains that his dad isn't even there, this guy launches into action to try and help find my great heart. So grandpa and this random neighbor guy apparently ran away with the actual carnival and towards where the workers had set up their trailers and whatnot. That's when they heard a girl crying from inside of them. The neighbor tries to open the door, but it won't budge. So he starts banging on it. Some evil son of a gun opens the door and tries to explain it away by saying my great aunt got lost or something that she's just inconsolable, crying in a way that Grandpa had never seen before. Scared, but sad at the same time. This neighbor then rushes my Grandpa and Great Aunt home and tells their parents all about what had happened. My Grandpa knows something bad happened to my sister, but it just doesn't know what, because she she won't talk about it. Obviously, my great-grandpa was absolutely furious. So he grabs a shotgun, rounds up a few buddies, and they went down to the carnival to basically do God knows what to the sky. Again, this is all from my dad. But according to him, this huge fight starts at the carnival. People on all sides almost get shot. Then they all freeze after the carnival chief fires a gun into the air. He then agrees to parlay with my great grandpa. That after talking for like 10 minutes in some weird looking corny trailer. As great grandpa walks away from the carnival empty handed. Everyone thought he was crazy. Some monster had just put his hands on his only daughter. And after a short powwow with the man in charge. He was happy to just walk, walk away, his buddies confront him on it. Obviously wanting to know what the deal was. My great grandpa apparently tells him to put a sock in it, because it's all been ironed now. That night, my great grandpa apparently puts on his boots and headed down to the carnival one more time before it left town. It meets up with this carny chief who asks if my great-grandpa still wants satisfaction, which he obviously did. The carny chief beckons to two workers who carry out like a basket or something before laying it in front of my great-grandpa, and they invited him to open the lid. He complied, and when the smell hit him, I doubt he had it in him not to pew, because according to my dad, The carnies had stacked the offending worker's separate head on a pile of his own guts, and his own junk had been stuffed into his mouth. The carny chief then told him, while pointing at his junk, first we cut off this, then we cut out those, then point to the guy's guts. Only when he stopped moving do we cut off that, then points to his head. Apparently after that, The carny chief once again asked my great grandpa, are you satisfied? He just nodded, turned, and then walked away. The carnival was gone the next day. I think he told my great aunt what happened to that guy too, because she never seemed to turn off about it. No, something really bad must have happened. They killed the guy but she actually went back to the carnival the next time it came around and borrow a face from my son, I guess. They were built different back then and just dealt with trauma differently or whatever. 
Or maybe it's much easier to get over this sort of thing when you know the guy who did it suffered on earth before he died. I suppose that's what freaks me out so much about my grandpa's story. That, that almost sounds like it came from a different country or something. All that poverty and vigilante justice. I just don't recognize that same kind of thing in America today. Not in such an extreme way anyways. And that sure had me counting my blessings. Let me tell you. Hey guys, thanks so much for all the support. If you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please feel free to do so. So back when I was growing up, I had a bunch of unsavory stuff happen to me and ended up being placed in a foster home. While technically it was basically a holding cell for kids to live until they found a real home. Because I was a hurt and untrusting kid. At that point, I cycled through my fair share to families. I stayed with an obese single man who I don't remember much about, but I do remember very bad vibes while staying in his house. My case manager must have thought so too because I went to another family shortly after. This is when I met the family. More specifically, the sob that the story is about. This wouldn't be my last home and I didn't live there long at all. So things have gotten foggy over the years, but I was probably around eight and 10 years old. It was a full house, six of us in total. My foster mother and father, two brothers and a sister. The only person I did not like straight out the gate was my sister. You know that feeling where you just know someone wants you off the earth? For me, it feels especially raw when it seems unjustified. Like, I know I was technically a foreign invader cancer cell in their home, but guess what? I was a mouthy brat too, and I gave her the attitude right back. So it goes without saying, she and I never got along. My brothers, on the other hand, I love them. We did everything together. They made me feel completely a part of the family, which is what made what they did to me so confusing. So far, the only slightly unusual thing about this family was that they had intercom system in their house. Mostly our mother would use it to tell us to sleep after hours. A few months go by and summer rolls around. They had been pumping me up about a swimming pool in the backyard for a while. The only thing was that it didn't have a lot of normalcy. I didn't even remotely know how to swim and was terrified at open water. On the day it happened, my brother and I were all by the pool. They also had a slide they used for the pool and went straight into the deep end. Looking back, that entire afternoon looked so set up, like the family planned this or something. I swear. They kept pressuring me to try the slide and that they would save me if I couldn't swim to the sides. I really wanted to be like them, free to do things without worrying about consequences. And I really believed they wouldn't let me drown. We were family, right? Okay, great. So I slid down into the ball. Seconds later, I start to drown. I don't know which way is up and I'm fighting for air for something to grab, anything. Well, it seems like it went on for way too long. And suddenly, my adoptive father has me barely above the water, holding me up with one hand. If at gunpoint I had to describe his face, I would say it was a demonic mix of lust and contempt. It was really blurry and happened fast, but bases like that are hard to forget. I could tell you drown right now, boy. That's what he said to me, those exact words. I don't quite recall what he referred to me as before that point, but I know it wasn't boy. I was crying and gasping for air, and he just held me there, holding the inches above the water for what I still don't get why. This was one of three or four times in my life that I truly believed that I was going to die. Could be worse, I guess, but anyways, eventually, he walked over to the edge of the pool and let me go right down. I was so terrified of him, I didn't know what to do. I just laid there and didn't want to be near anyone in that house. 
I remember one of the strangest things about that experience was the aftermath. We went to a Mexican restaurant at night, and though they all acted like nothing happened, I was confused, angry, and scared. Maybe it was insignificant to them. Maybe it was not an abnormal thing to them, or he did it to teach me a lesson or something. Anyways, forget that, and forget that family. Soon after, I updated my case manager on all that mess, and I was out of that house within days, if I recall correctly. All you people with both parents, try to make things right with them if they aren't. Always appreciate your family, because I don't have any. And to be honest, life sucks. Before I even get to my story, I want to emphasize the point of me writing this. There was more than enough blame for what happened to go around for all of us. The decision was ours to cut corners. Trusting our mother's home to a stranger was stupid. No one denies that. However, the events that unfolded as a result were 100% not our fault. We did everything society tells us to do. The police were called, and their job was to protect my sister. They failed in their job. This is on their hands. My number one aim is to impress upon you to know that it's important to fully vet any individual before allowing them to access your home. The following story is written to drive home this very important point. At the end of 2019, just before Christmas in fact, my mother passed away from a long-term illness. So I was already married and set up a home on my own. My mother left her home to my younger sister, Emily. Emily had been renting up until this time. Release it was just ended, so she moved in until she was sure of what she was going to do with it. She knew she had my support. Regardless of her decision, my wife and I threw her a surprise housewarming party for her. At the party, one of Emily's co-workers gave her a kitten as a gift. She was unable to have any pets in her apartment. It was love at first sight. The weeks after the party were life as usual for all of us. Emily managed to litter train the kitten, and all was going well. Just before Valentine's Day, Emily's employer notified her of a business conference she was required to attend. It was part of her job and this will be a first trip since she had moved into the new house. Normally, this will be simple, but now with the kitten, things were a tad more complicated. My family was unable to watch the kitten because of my daughter's allergies. Kenneling was briefly considered until the price was found to be too great. Besides, she didn't like the idea of her precious little angel being locked up for three days. She chose to search on Craigslist for house sitters. An earlier call to a service proved too high. Also, she found this young girl around 19 who claimed to be an independent house sitter. They spoke first on the phone, then met at the house so she could look around. The girl seemed kind and professional. After agreeing on an amount, the deal was set. Two weeks later, Emily kissed her kid goodbye and left her trip. She checked in the first night and all sounds like it was going well. Two days later, she returned to a nightmare. The clean, beautiful home she had left was now scattered with clothes and dirty dishes. When she confronted the girl, the girl got mad and said she wasn't a maid. Things only got worse from there. My sister was horrified to see that the litter box was full and the kitten had already begun going on the floor. Certainly not the poor cat's fault. And this infuriated my sister and she refused to pay the girl. An argument broke out and the police were eventually called. They really couldn't do much other than force the girl to leave the property. But the girl was furious. She vowed she'd get back at my sister as she left. This was all set in front of the police, but they obviously didn't take that threat seriously. 
the officer went on their way, and my sister began cleaning up the mess inside. A few days passed, and Emily tried to put the experience behind her. That Friday, soon after returning from work, a man rang the doorbell and asked for her. She identified herself, and the man began demanding the money owed to the young girl. My sister calmly explained the situation, but the only grew more aggressive. Although she was now terrified, she held her ground and refused. This was when the man backhanded her. She fell back and hit her head on the floor. Unfortunately, it wasn't done. He approached her and demanded the money again. My sister, who was clearly concussed, didn't answer, so he punched her unconscious. Apparently, while she was out, he entered the house and stole all the cash from her purse. But the time she had awakened, he was gone. It took her several minutes to crawl to her phone and call 911. They arrived soon after, and she was rushed to the hospital. I'm happy to say that there's no long-term physical injuries, but mentally, Emily was a mess, and still is honestly to be frank. And I know the identity of the man in his location and would have killed him. Fortunately, I regained my senses and agreed to leave it in the authorities' hands, despite their inability to prevent it. The responsible parties were found and arrested within a couple of days. It wasn't some great mystery after all. The man who assaulted Emily was an ex-boyfriend of the young girl. She had promised him half of the money to retrieve it. The young girl claimed she never or intended anyone to be hurt. But her threat in front of witnesses, cops at that, sealed her fate. She managed to get away with probation because she had no priors or acts on the other hand had a long record. He was given three years. But once the COVID crisis began, he was released early. The entire family was less than happy to hear of the lenient sentences. But criminals getting off easy is now new under the sun of these days. In the months since the attack, everyone has done their most to be there for Emily. Her recovery is going well and she seems to be responding to therapy. The lockdowns approved the blessing for her. She'd been able to heal at a much slower and calm pace. Until restrictions are lifted completely, she'd been approved to work from home, or little furry friend has served as a priceless companion for her during these terrible times. Although some may say he was the cause of this whole awful mess. Uncle glad he's been around to keep her company.